this exciting time at its, in its uh, inauguration and the initial stages. Um, we know that developed, uh, developed countries over the last 20 years have been taking steps to reduce early diagnosis and manage chronic diseases effectively. But in many countries in Africa, the focus is still on management of acute episodes rather than their prevention. So it's really wonderful that a number of key Irish and African professionals have come together to support best practice in treating and preventing non-communicable disease in Africa. And as a starting point, they are supporting small scale projects in Togo and in Malawi. And also while doing that, they're advocating for increased awareness. And we're gonna hear more about the Alliance shortly. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, as always, so that you're aware, a recording of this webinar will be available on globalhealth.ie after the event. Um, you can see that we are live streaming right now on YouTube. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please use the question and answer feature at the bottom of the screen. So I have the absolute pleasure of um, handing over to Dr. Anna Clark. Um, Dr. Clark retired last year after 20 years of working with Diabetes Federation of Ireland, initially in health promotion, but then extending so that role and within that role, she became the main advocate for people with diabetes in Ireland and managed the research portfolio of the Diabetes Ireland Research. Alliance. In 2016, she took part in a health mission uh, to Nigeria and engaged with St. Joseph's Community Hospital. And she now not just hopes, but already is using her time to further support best practice of NCDs, non-communicable diseases in Africa. And she's acting as the secretary for the Ireland Africa Alliance of Non-Communicable Diseases. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much, Nadine. And good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this the inaugural meeting of the Ireland Irish African Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases. As Nadine said, I was invited onto the group in November 2020, uh, which was very timely for me. Uh, but the group had already met quite a number of times before that. Uh, and I've joined then on the monthly meetings and as I had time in my hands, took over the role as secretary. Um, so for this webinar, we're going to have three main speakers. We will have Professor Richard Firth, Dr. Katrina Hefferman with the support of Professor Bello, who is actually joining us from Togo and Dr. Ray O'Connor. Each presentation will be 10 minutes long and then all the speakers will join us as panelists and uh, you can ask them any questions. Now, just find the Q&A under the more button on the end of your screen so that you'll be able to put in a question once it comes to you. And you'll get the opportunity then for that question to be put to the panel at the end of the, record, uh, the presentations. As already stated, the uh, recording is going out live on the Irish Global Health Network YouTube. Uh, so if you're a tweeter, maybe you just put out a tweet and give us a shout out for other people to join us. But just before I introduce you to the first speaker, may I give you a little bit of history in terms of the um, Ireland-Africa Alliance uh, for Non-Communicable Diseases. So as you can see here, uh, hopefully you can see my screen, but basically the Ireland Africa Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases is made up of professionals. Uh, we have endocrinologists, cardiologists, public health, policy influencers, primary care, uh, physicians, nursing, uh, academia and researchers. And they all came together under the leadership of Professor Fert to discuss the challenges of non-communicable diseases in African countries. The group have met monthly uh, since I joined them last November. And over the course of that time, we formalized the governance structures and are starting to implement a longer term plan. Currently, the founding members of the group form a steering committee, and then there's two subgroups, but we're looking for more people to join. So if you feel you are interested in the health of African people and particularly interested in non-communicable diseases, feel free to join us. And I'm just coming back in there just to say, if you can make your screen bigger, it'd be easier for everybody to see it. You're able to do that? Yes, perfect, thanks. Apologies there. 
So as you can see from the logo, which uh, you can see on the screen now, it is Ireland and Africa and two house martins flying from country to country. And as we know, the house martins like Ireland for the summer and uh, Africa for the winter. So we hope that adequately reflects how we are going to work with our African healthcare workers and support them in their endeavours to tackle the NCG uh, epidemic unfolding there. So the mission statement of the uh, Ireland Africa Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases is the prevention when possible and the management of NCD with a view to improving quality of life and reducing premature death in Africa. So that actually reflects well on the World Health Organization plan as well for non-communicable diseases. And I suppose the uh, World Health Organization plan goes one step further in terms of developed countries should be supporting those lower economic countries. So this Ireland Africa Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases is very timely placed in the hope that Ireland will be able to support. But I'm going to pass you on to our first speaker, who is Professor Richard Fert, who will explain to you what non-communicable diseases are and the burden they impose. Professor Firth is a senior endocrinologist who is well known to many people uh, for his work in the Matter Hospital and the Maternity Hospitals, but also he was clinical lead for the National Diabetes Programme here in Ireland, and he's past president of the Irish Endocrine Society. And in between all of that, he would found time to take part in International Diabetes Federation lecture tours, uh, visiting Kenya and the Cameroons and also China and India. And since he's retired from the clinical role in the matter, he has taken on board uh, a special interest in a developing an NCD diabetes centre in Loma in Toga. And I'm sure he's going to fill you in on that. So, uh, Richard, uh, I'm going to pass you over to, the, to you and uh, just let take over. Professor Firth. So uh, can I share the screen? Yes, I think I can now. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Anna and, uh, and Nadine. And I'm delighted to be able to uh, be at the launch of this uh, uh, alliance, which has been over a year in the gestation. In gestation. Now, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about the burden and what non clinical diseases are. And um, now, uh, maybe... Why am I not getting? Yes. Okay, well, this is a loose definition really of non clinical diseases, which are also known as chronic diseases in the UK and in Ireland, but as NCDs in pretty much the rest of the world. They're diseases that are lifelong. They're not transmitted from person to person. They're characterized by long duration and slow progression. They develop over time, initially, with no visible signs or symptoms. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm being blocked out a little bit here, so that's grand. Uh, but they lead to complications and a protracted period of impaired health. Um, I just want to get rid of that side panel there so I can see uh, a bit better. That's better. So they cause premature ill health, inability to function and work, they reduce the quality of life and lead to premature death. Now, just to explain why this is important, because for the last 20 years, non clinical diseases have been responsible for more deaths globally than any other cause. And to illustrate this, I've illustrated here the uh, uh, life expectancy uh, pages from the United Nations for somebody born in 2018. And on the left panel, you see the developed countries. This is the first page of the, of the list, and this is the last page of the list. And you see from the first world countries on the first page of the list that you can expect to live on average between men and women over 82 years. In contrast, 38 of the lowest, shortest lived populations in Africa occur 
uh, sorry, of 40 uh, lowest uh, lived populations in the world, 38 of them are in Africa. And I've illustrated this, for instance, with sub-Saharan Africa, which has a life expectancy on average of 61 years, and somewhat stunningly in Nigeria, 54 years. Now, you might say, well, this is all very well, I mean, because these places are really the, 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 the uh, resting place of the uh, infectious, communicable uh, 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 diseases. But if you look at this second panel here, which is really a heat map of deaths under 70 years of age due to non-communicable diseases, you will see that sub-Saharan Africa, right across this whole patch here, over 70% of people die prematurely it's due to non-communicable diseases. And this is in the crucible of HIV, malaria, hepatitis, meningitis, tuberculosis, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, a huge and major problem. Why is this? Well, uh, uh, I think I might have gone, no, that's fine. It's because of the scourge of obesity. And um, if you look at the right-hand panel here, these are the trends in obesity over the last 40 years. And if you just look at this as men and this as women, the places where obesity is increasing most rapidly is successively West Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, and East Africa. So this is a powder keg that has already started to explode. I think I have missed a, I'm sorry, I did miss a slide here. How do we get non communicable diseases? Well, these are the basically the common ones, diabetes, apologies for this going backwards, but this, these are diabetes, hypertension, stroke, ischemic heart disease, dyslipidemia, many cancers which are obesity dependent, and COPD as well. And they arise because an interplay between modified behavioral risk factors and certain genetic and epigenetic adaptations. Now, these adaptations are hardwired DNA changes, which make us equipped to deal with a long, prolonged periods of undernutrition. And that is essentially the history of mankind. We've always been undernourished. But of course, things changed in the 1970s. And suddenly we uh, had a decreased level of, uh, increased level of physical inactivity with motorized transport. We had an unhealthy diet in terms of hypercaloric hypercaloric and poor quality diet on a background of tobacco and alcohol. So these genetic and epigenetic adaptations, which taught us to store, store, store very efficiently, to use energy very efficiently, uh, worked very well to our advantage until we ran into this problem. And that of course then led to obesity with accompanying increase with the, uh, the it, its bedfellows, increased weight circumference, insulin resistance, type two diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, inflammation, CRP uh, measurements, and the uh, premature and premature vascular death. So the, the metabolic syndrome is essentially the same as these. And the fact that they are considered to have the same etiopathology suggests, and many people believe now that these are all the same disease, just different facets of it. Now, just if we take diabetes as, the, uh, as an index of the non communicable diseases, currently it's estimated that about half a billion people in the world are living with diabetes. And this is due to increase to 634 million by 2030 and 784 million in 2045. An equal number of people with diabetes also have pre-diabetes and they, these people are likely to progress to diabetes, adding to these numbers. The cost of uh, diabetes in terms of health expenditure, this is direct health expenditure, this is not lost income or indirect expenditure, is currently at about one trillion US dollars per year. And this is up 316% in the past 15 years. Now, you and I didn't choose to enter the healthcare profession based on statistics and health economics, because, but these figures really hide an enormous amount of human suffering and premature loss and uh, bankrupt many, many people. So we've nearly finished. Now, what is the answer? Well, the WHO on, in 2030, its agenda for sustainable development committed to reducing premature mortality from non-communicable diseases by one third through treatment and prevention. 
Now, this is a very lofty goal, and so far we've failed to uh, reach our targets, but this requires collaboration between all sectors, including health, finance, transport, education, agriculture, planning, etc. So we come down to prevention of any NCDs and better management of NCDs. We can prevent by reducing common modifiable risk factors, which you've seen. This is considered to be a low cost option, but of course it's extraordinarily difficult to implement. We also need to manage NCDs better from an early stage, so we have early detection, and to prevent therefore the development of comp complications, which are the expensive and uh, very difficult problems that patients have to face, uh, the, the chronic complications of diabetes. Poverty and low SE groups are closely linked to NCDs, and I've seen this, they quickly drain household budgets through lengthy and expensive treatment and loss of income, and they force millions into poverty. And of course, if you are spending money every month on tablets uh, and you're on the poverty line, the first thing that goes is the medications. Now, for the last seven or eight years, I've uh, visited Togo 13 times. This is, it's in West Africa here. It's a, a small country with 6 million uh, population, partly chosen because it has similar population to Ireland, which also makes access to central decision-making government uh, easier. It's also um, a relatively foreign aid free zone. It's Francophone, uh, but it's also a lovely country and the people are absolutely lovely. So uh, the first few, uh, first few years, I just did clinics and um, lectures and taught the doctors, etc. And then about three or four years ago, I was approached by the authorities to ask, would I please um, renovate an old building that was completely ruined and disused and, and overgrown and deserted uh, for an NCD center uh, in Togo? Uh, and so I swallowed hard, went home and managed to raise money. And the refurbishment is complete, but we're awaiting uh, furnishing and equip equipping of the center, but that has stopped for the last two years, unfortunately, uh, because of COVID. Likewise, we raised money to bring um, a, um, a senior Togolese nurse, Nazif Lavani, who's absolutely outstanding. He came over to Ireland for three months and we trained him up as a diabetes nurse specialist, and we hope that he will go back to Togo to manage, be resident manager for the uh, for the center. So I just have a couple of acknowledgements to make. First of all, my sincere gratitude to the NCD group members. They have worked on a voluntary basis very hard and have got us to where we are today. Thanks to the Global Health Alliance Est and the HSC for the support. My donors towards the NCD center in Togo, my friends, colleagues and fundraisers have been wonderful. Uh, hello, uh, what's happened here? Uh, that shouldn't have been Yes. And uh, finally, in Togo, the uh, Minister for Health, Professor Mijiawa, who I know uh, has been supportive, and my very good friend, Professor Bello, who you will meet later. He's a senior practicing neurologist, but is also head of the non communicable diseases department in the, in the Ministry for Health. Uh, my medical nursing colleagues in Togo and uh, uh, Mr. Kwame Zakpa. Now, if I could get my picture back, I don't know how I can do that. Um, Yes, click to exit. Uh, okay, thank can you. Can you see me? Can you see me? Uh, have yes. you a picture of me? Because I want to show you something. Uh, you probably see me wearing uh, a football jersey. And I, there's no uh, guess uh, for no prizes for guessing where it's from. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, I was given. Can you see anybody see what's written on the <laughs> Of it. It, it does say Togo. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, I'll hand you back again. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay, Richard, you can uh, let me take back the screen, please, yep. when you're ready. But thank yep. you for a very enlightening presentation and really demonstrating why we as Irish professionals should get involved and support current African efforts. Now, I'll just remind people that if they have any questions for Richard or indeed for me, just to uh, add them in at the Q and A at the bottom of the screen. The screen. Uh, Richard provided an answer to the current problem with reference to the World Health Organization position on prevention and better management, and it is that with foremost in the, our mind that the Ireland African Alliance set their objectives, um, and I. Uh, 
um, hopefully bringing them up at the moment there, just the objectives of the Ireland African Alliance. Apologies now, it just doesn't seem to be progressing for me and uh, you're still only seeing the mission statement of... Um, no, apologies, I can't bring up the objectives, but I will actually refer you to the um, website Global Health uh, and to our, the Ireland African Alliance uh, for non communicable diseases page on that, which will actually show you the objectives. But basically, our objectives are to partner with local professors, professionals to ascertain their needs. And our next two speakers will show you how you, they're doing that. We also have the objective of raising awareness of NCDs and their effect on populations at these webinars and the press releases that we sent out, and hopefully social media will actually help us to uh, spread that word. We also want to influence national policies and uh, for the, us that means actually focusing on Irish aid policy, uh, which doesn't even mention NCDs at all. We also want to highlight best practice, but we're very much aware uh, that the best practice models that are coming from developed countries may not be that that will work with the African countries. So maybe some more research is needed and some small interventions in African countries uh, with proper evaluation will help to determine what works for them. As Richard said, we're focusing on diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular and respiratory disease. But we also want to promote education and our second speaker, Dr. Ray O'Connell, will show you how he is using education uh, to support efforts in Malawi by the education of professionals. We also want to educate the public as well. And then we will try to undertake technical collaborations because we know from COVID that a lot of advances happen uh, very quickly uh, with um, when the need is there. And that is not unique to uh, the developed countries. Uh, so we will hope to have that as an objective as well. But as I stated already, our first objective is about sharing uh, and going into partnership with local African uh, nations. So I will now call on Dr. Katrina Heffernan to uh, bring forward, to explain how we're currently doing this in Togo, which was already referenced by uh, Professor Firth, but she'll explain better what she's doing. Professor Bello is a clinical neurologist and lead for NCD prevention in Togo. Um, he also has responsibility for nurse education in the Loma School of Nursing. Dr. Katrina Heatherman is a lecturer in the School of Nursing and Healthcare Sciences in Munster University, but with strong links to Connecticut University and is currently working with a number of EU uh, countries on a key a two par strategic partnership to develop, share and transfer best practice and innovative approaches in the area of education and healthcare. And I'll just remind you on the Global Health Network, there is a longer biography on all of the speakers. Katrina, I'll hand over to you to explain how nursing education is organised in Togo and how working with Professor Bella has enlightened your view of what we might be able to do to support his work on NCD prevention and management. Thank you very much, Anna. So this is a joint presentation between Professor Bello, the Minister of Health in Togo and myself. And the aim of our presentation, if I can get the slide going, just bear with me. And you might go to the slideshow. Okay. Apologies for that, everybody. The aim of Professor Bello and my presentation is to introduce you to our plan for NCD education in Africa. And our presentation is based on three pillars at both the micro and the macro level. The three pillars are partner, pilot, and platform. And Professor Bello and myself will talk you through these three Ps. So we started with a partner, like Richard had said, in Africa, which is the country of Togo, and that's the macro level. 
And this map here shows you the country, Togo. And at the bottom in the southwest, we have the city, Lome. And then we have the second largest city, Kara, which is around 400 kilometers north of Lome. And I wanted to show you this so you could get an idea of how similar in size Togo is to Ireland. Our next part really is to put Togo into context. And I'm going to talk you through the demographics in relation to Ireland. And Professor Bello will then speak about the demographics in relation to Togo. You will see here on your screen that Ireland is represented under our logo uh, with the Irish map. And Ireland, um, according to the National Health Workforce accounts in 2020, the popula population of Ireland was approximately 5 million. We're, we all now know that this has grown. At the time, we had around 58,500 nurses registered within the nursing board in Ireland. Our nursing programs are all four years long. We have approximately 1,700 nurse graduates each year. And that works out at about 123 nurses per 10,000 population. And this is in comparison to what we're now going to show you with the country Togo. And Professor Bellow will now talk you through the demographics in relation to Togo. You're very welcome, Professor Bello. Merci beaucoup. Uh, au Togo, nous avons uh, 1094 infirmières qui sont professionnelles et nous avons également 699 qui sont formées dans les centres. Uh, en cours de formation maintenant, nous avons 1793 personnel auxiliaire médicaux qui sont en train d'être formés et la couverture par rapport à la santé c'est 61% donc il y a un gap de 39% pour couvrir l'ensemble du territoire alors lorsque vous voyez la densité des infirmières par rapport à la population togolaise c'est 2 à 3 infirmières pour 10 000 habitants alors Chaque année, 100 infirmières sortent de nos écoles de formation, soit trois ans de formation. Ceci relève des données du ministère de la Santé de 2020. À vous. Next slide, please. Alors, lorsque vous voyez... Nous, le Togo projette 20 000 à 30 000 infirmières jusqu'à 2030. Donc, vous voyez que le chemin est long et nous avons beaucoup de choses à faire. Alors, si on voit les infirmières... Alors, là, ça va vite. Euh, oui, c'est bon là. Donc, euh, lorsque vous voyez euh, de Togo pour 15% euh, en, en matière de, euh, de, de, de médecins sur l'ensemble du territoire, euh, les dentistes représentent 0,1% par rapport au GAC euh, national et les pharmaciens 5,2%. Alors, lorsque nous voyons les, les infirmiers, plus les infirmiers formés de structure, ça fait 47,86% de ce que nous devons avoir. Et les médecins généralistes et spécialistes, 12,97%. Les dentistes sont, représentent 0,19% de ce qu'on doit avoir. Et les pharmaciens, 1,49%. Next slide, please. Voilà, euh, l'éducation ou bien la formation des infirmières est régie par l'État, euh, est régie par l'État, et, et les infirmiers sont partiellement euh, formés euh, dans, au, au Togo, et la gouvernance et le leadership euh, constituent 
euh, un véritable euh, gap à, à atteindre pour cette formation des infirmiers et des infirmières. Next slide, please. Voilà, euh, donc euh, voilà une photo qui, 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 qui montre des infirmières qui ont terminé leur formation et qui sont sous l'arbre, sous les tropiques. Euh, voilà. Next slide. Alors, le, la formation des infirmiers et des infirmières est régie par quatre ministères. Le ministère de la Santé, le ministère de la formation technique, le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur et le ministère de la fonction publique. Next slide, please. Yes. Alors, dans les hôpitaux, euh, les infirmières ont, ont une activité très importante. À la fois, les infirmières produisent les soins et s'occupent de... de, de de maintien euh, et s'occupe également de, de la partie nursing euh, au cours des soins. À tous les niveaux, euh, au niveau de la nation, les infirmières sont là, parfois font des consultations médicales, prescrivent des médicaments et font parfois euh, des examens médicaux et parfois ce sont des infirmières qui dirigent euh, certaines structures au Togo. À ce niveau, euh, ces infirmiers sont souvent euh, des leaders dans, en matière de euh, ressources humaines et, et dans les centres. Suivant, s'il vous plaît. Thank you very much. That's okay. Merci beaucoup. Thank Merci you. beaucoup. Merci. Thank you very much, Professor Bello. Thank you. So from here, what we did is we reached out to all of the schools of nursing within the five provinces of Togo, and we made contact and had many discussions with each of them. We undertook needs analysis in relation to the education that is provided to date and what education needed to be done. I mentioned earlier that we had the three P's. Well, at the micro level, our partner will be the ECOL National, the Auxiliary Medical, which is short, which we call ENAM. And this is a school that is, or a university that is situated in the city of Lome. And we have decided to partner with this school. Um, it's also going to be our pilot uh, site. And this here is a picture of the entrance to this school. It's, Uh, the head of the school is Mr. Bassan Lamboni, and um, it was chosen as it is located in the capital city, and it is also a public school, and the region has very good internet coverage in comparison to the rest of Togo. So Esther funding has assisted us towards the development of a memorandum of understanding between both countries. And it is envisaged that representation from Togo will travel to Ireland and vice versa. All do documents that we are developing are written in the languages of French and English. And we also include interpreters at our meetings to ensure clear understanding across all parties. And finally, the final P in the three pillars is the platform. A decision on the chosen platform will also emerge from the memorandum of understanding that we are developing. But our vision is that we will use a shared platform, for example, Moodle or Canvas. Technology is going to be key to delivering um, NCD education in Togo. We will be providing diabetes education to educators in this schools of nursing in their first language, which will be French, And the format we believe will be blended learning with both synchronous and asynchronous type teaching. We're also um, hoping to, to deliver train the trainer type programs so that education will continue to be passed on from one healthcare worker to the next in Togo. 
the Train the Train courses will be designed to equip nurses and or healthcare workers across the city of Loma with the skills to train and educate others working in NCD prevention in Togo. These programmes will have certifications attached to them, similar to the QQI Level 6 awards we have here in Ireland at the moment. We also want to provide diabetes education to nurses and community workers via the schools of nursing in each region, but we will start with the School of Nursing in Loam. We will also provide basic skill training, for example, on urinalysis and glucose monitoring to the Togi's nurses and healthcare workers. We will be engaging with equipment providers, for example, those that are involved with your analysis and glucose monitoring to help support um, getting some of them for our classes in Togo. We will also provide the pilot school of nursing, which is ENAM, with a computer or some computers so that other healthcare workers can access the shared platform on their computer in their school of nursing. And finally, we will work with interpreters to ensure that the small bite-sized programs on diabetes education are translated accordingly. Thank you very much, Anna. Anna, you're muted. Apologies. Apologies there. Um, can I actually call on uh, Dr. David Kelly, who is a public health specialist and also fluent French speaker, who will actually just give us a brief uh, translation of what Professor Bello had said there. Dr. Kelly, are you available? If not, maybe we'll call on Ms. Ferris Rans, maybe you could give a very brief uh, just overview of what Professor Bellow stated. Well, I think um, Professor Kelly, your, your sound is not working. It's your sound. Come back in. So, uh, so David will try and sort his uh, his sound out there. Um, and I think it's the slides. I think were were very good to support what um, what Dr. Bella was saying. So I think it's okay at this point um, that everybody will have read those slides um, to make sure they could understand. But if anybody has a question for Dr. Bello, they could put it into the uh, question and answers, and we will we will translate that back for Dr. Bello. Okay, that's fine. So maybe we should move on to the next speaker which is Dr. Ray O'Connor, and he's speaking on behalf of myself, but also his colleagues, Dr. P Peter Harrington and Dr. Joe Gallagher from the PAM Surgery in Gori about his work in the Gori Malawi Partnership. Ray is a Senior Research Fellow and Adjunct Senior Clinical Lecturer in the University of Limerick Graduate Entry Medical Programme. He's also Associate Professor Director of the HSE West GP Training Programme and uh, a practicing general practitioner here in Ireland as well. He's always had a strong interest in type 2 diabetes and will now explain how he's using that expertise to support type 2 diabetes management in Malawi. Ray, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Um, okay, so first of all, I'm very delighted to be present at the launch of the um, Alliance and uh, discussing the Gori Malawi Health Partnership uh, this was established a couple of years ago by two visionary GPs, uh, Dr. Peter Harrington and Dr. Joe Gallagher, who, uh, as Anna said, practiced in the PAM surgery in Gorey County, Wexford. And they had the inspirational idea of teaching healthcare workers to diagnose and manage NCDs and non-communicable diseases by developing protocols and educational videos. Uh, these are delivered uh, by the Moodle educational platform uh, using social media, and WhatsApp groups um, and uh, via the 3G mobile network. And most of the data I'm presenting here is from their work. So um, Malawi uh, was chosen. Uh, it's one of the poorest countries in the world and the medical systems and the management of NCDs there are very poorly developed. So as you can see, as the house martin flies, it's about 11 and a half thousand kilometers away, but 
as uh, the Boeing jetliner flies, it's closer to 12 and a half thousand miles, so quite a distance to cover. Uh, but our program aims to work at system strengthening both pharmacy and at healthcare worker level for the management of NCDs. So uh, a more updated version of this slide has been shown, but basically it shows that Africa is one of the highest rates of deaths from NCDs in the world uh, between the ages of 30 and 70 years of age. So this is a photograph of a group of fishermen who are, I suppose, subsistence fishermen in that it's a barely hand to mouth existence. They live in the mud huts that you can see clearly uh, behind uh, the wicker fence there. But you can also see in the background uh, the 3G mobile phone tower. And the idea was hatched to develop short videos for dissemination um, via Moodle, WhatsApp and social media. Um, using the 3G mobile network. Um, so just a, a number of um, educational modules have been developed, but just considering hypertension for uh, initially uh, causing seven and a half million premature deaths per year, affecting almost half the population of uh, adults in Africa and accounting for 80% of cardiovascular mortality. Um, so uh, just we use um, Kirkpatrick's model of measuring the effectiveness of a training program. So the initial um, level is the reaction, measuring how engaged the students were, how actively they contributed and how they reacted to training. Next is the learning level, measuring what the trainees have and haven't learned, followed by behavior, how well they applied their training. And then finally, analyzing the results of the training. So um, these photographs are taken from uh, myself and Peter Harrington uh, went to um, Malawi to uh, St. John's Hospital in Mizuzu in northern Malawi recently. And that's the hospital that the um, health partnership is associated with. And we focus there on teaching on rheumatic heart disease. So you can see the photograph on the left um, the Moodle um, app has been downloaded uh, onto their uh, mobile phones. Uh, they've then uh, engaged with the Gorni Malawi Health Partnership um, Moodle education platform. And they take the pre-module um, quiz to find their established level of learning, their existing level of learning. Uh, they then uh, go through the very focused um, educational module on the rheumatic heart disease. And then on the right hand side, you can see Peter delivering um, just a case study of a child with um, streptococcal throat infection who develops rheumatic heart uh, disease, um, going through the uh, knowledge of the uh, students that they've uh, developed and thereby helping to show the kind of model that we uh, try to use in imparting this very important practical education uh, to the uh, students. Um, so the Moodle is used by the Gori Miller Library Health Partnership. It's an open source uh, learning management system. There's a before and after quiz. It indeed attracts engagement of the students and it can be used in remote areas and they can download the data so that it can be used even if the mobile internet is, is poor. Um, to date, uh, modules that have been developed are very uh, succinct and focused. Uh, on asthma, rheumatic heart disease, heart failure, hypertension, COVID-19. And I've just been involved in developing a module on type two diabetes um, as well. So um, Zoom and WhatsApp are used uh, to discuss cases with the um, healthcare personnel on the ground. In this case, um, uh, Gori communicates uh, with um, Mizuzu uh, using um, Zoom uh, to discuss uh, problem cases and that can be quite helpful and uh, shows a good degree of interaction uh, between ourselves and themselves, which, you know, trans transfers across uh, the long distances. Um, so just looking at hypertension, uh, which uh, was a particular success story that we just wanted to highlight this uh, local focal uh, type of approach can be very successful. So a, a protocol was developed and was introduced in St. John's Hospital and drug choice was based on, number one, their availability, their clinical effectiveness and also their cost 
So we take the case of Gertrude, a 66 year old lady uh, who has hypertension for 11 years. She's on a rather complex regimen, um, taking six tablets a day, some of them three times a day. And as you can see, at a cost of approximately uh, 25,000 Malawian quatches uh, per year. So um, this is substituted by a much simpler regimen involving taking three tablets just once a day. Um, and it's uh, less than half the cost of what she was taking uh, before. But how effective is it? So to answer that question, we use REDCap. This is open source software for use in clinical trials, and it allows the collection of anonymized data in the cloud, and that can be then uh, shared and analyzed with ourselves back here or indeed with any other partners that will help us with data analysis. And six months data uh, on uh, 200 patients uh, show the baseline BP uh, with poor control, 150 over 89, with six months later, much better control, both statistically and clinically uh, significant improvement. So the important point here is that uh, uh, drugs that are more effective, that are simpler, um, uh, can be used to get better uh, control. And it just so happens that they're also uh, cheaper as well, therefore making it more sustainable. Um, so uh, we've now gone on to an awareness campaign for rheumatic heart disease, a recent study published two weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, regarding um, on Ugandan children show that approximately 3% of them um, aged 5 to 17 had latent uh, rheumatic heart disease. So it's indeed timely and appropriate uh, to bring this about. And um, we're doing that. Um, so type 2 diabetes, as I said, we've just written a module uh, on type 2 diabetes in conjunction with local staff. And indeed, uh, the person who gave us dietetic advice is a recent volunteer who has a master's in dietetics. And we were delighted to welcome her on board and help us to uh, design the diet around what's locally affordable and available for people. Um, and uh, that's really helpful. We're also very excited about negotiating with the Leicester Diabetes Centre, who developed the uh, Desmond Self-Management Education Program. And indeed, um, they developed and piloted um, a version of Desmond uh, that was culturally, contextually and linguistically adapted uh, for the Malawian um, setting and was indeed piloted there. And they recently published on that in the Extend study in the uh, BMJ Open. Uh, we'd very much like to thank our sponsors, including the Irish College of GPs, the HSE and uh, Esther Ireland. I'd like to finish just with the photograph. This is myself and Peter at our recent um, visit to St. John's Hospital in Mizuzu. Um, uh, Lillian, our nurse, and Hastings, the clinical officer uh, who run the NCD clinic in the hospital. And the insert there is uh, Joe Gallagher, who's uh, Peter's partner in the practice. And um, thank you very much for listening. And that's it. Thank you very much, Ray. You just might. Thank you very much. Uh, a very worthwhile project. Uh, and as you know, patient and professional uh, diabetes education and education in general is a special interest of mine. So delighted to hear uh, about all the work that's going on there. Uh, before we join uh, the panelists back on screen, can I just remind you if you have any questions uh, to please put them into the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but uh, just to bring you back to the Ireland African Alliance uh, for Non-Communicable Diseases, we are a group that's obviously in our infancy, uh, but in order to further support the work of especially the two projects that you've heard about today, the Ireland African Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases has developed a three-year strategic plan. And I'd just like to share that with you. Uh, as it does provide a roadmap of where we want to get to by 2023. Uh, so maybe you might put up that slide on screen so that we can share the uh, strategic plan that the Ireland African Alliance has um, developed. And there's four pillars to that. So the first pillar obviously is governance because as a group that's in its infancy, uh, we uh, need to develop robust uh, standards and explicit written agreed set of structures 
uh, and how the communication works uh, and the procedures and rules for the group. The next pillar is advocacy, and we are the voice of Irish experts with a special interest in NCD prevention and management in Africa. As we are the first such group in Ireland, we'll endeavour to influence key stakeholders. And I suppose really where we'll be focusing some time on is the Irish aid policy and identifying who the key stakeholders are there and how we might be able to influence their decisions for funding going forward. Because obviously we want to get NCD management in lower economic countries, uh, especially those countries that Irish aid is being provided to in Africa, uh, some ring fenced money for that. On the education side, we want to raise awareness of the need for action among the public and relevant stakeholders and where possible support education of prevention professionals on NCD prevention and best practice management, both here and in Africa, acknowledging that it's currently not known uh, what interventions might work best in African countries, but it's the small projects and specifically uh, the Dr. Ray O'Connor's work that's going to help us to identify what is working uh, and how that is best evaluated. And then uh, evaluation is a very important uh, key factor. And we hopefully may be able to help African countries with audits, et cetera, um, because it's uh, only by developing the baseline data that we'll be able to move forward. So if anyone is listening in and they have an interest uh, in the hearing uh, more about the health situation of African people, or indeed, I'm really putting out a call now for any people who are working in Ireland with a special interest in Africa, or maybe of African descent, or maybe from Africa, we'd be really interested in hearing from them. And you can do so uh, just on the next slide there. Uh, I've given the email address where you can contact us directly, or you can put in a submission through the Global Health uh, page under go on to globalhealth.ie. Under partners, you'll see the Ireland, Ireland Africa Alliance for Non Communicable Diseases, uh, and you can submit through that. Now, as we don't seem to have any uh, questions and answers uh, coming in, I'm very conscious that we uh, have a time limit. Um, I am going to just say uh, thank you very, very much to Professor Richard Burt, to Dr. Katrina Hefferman, to Professor Bello from join joining us in Togo, and to Dr. Ray O'Connor. Uh, we are delighted with the hear about the projects that are going on and uh, we've had a great meeting and I'm sure you've all gained some additional knowledge. I know I have. I'm really struck by the enthusiasm and the commitment of all our presenters today who've given up their time freely today but also for all of the Ireland African uh, Alliance meetings uh, and the projects that they are committed to. On behalf of the speakers, I thank you for listening. Uh, on behalf of the audience speakers, I thank you. And on behalf of the Ireland African Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, and don't forget the recording will be available on globalhealth.ie. Uh, I specifically must thank the staff of Global Health, especially Joan Bulger and Nor Nosset, for their guidance up to today and their assistance today, and also to Ms. Nadine Ferris France for her introduction today and the support that she has given us to date. Can yeah. I remind people that the webinar is only the first of many? And if you have any suggestions, then will you please take a few minutes to fill in the evaluation form, which will appear now in the chat. Uh, and on a final note, can you please spread the word about the existence of the Ireland African Alliance for Non-Communicable Disease? And if you're not already engaged with us, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and we'd love to hear from any of your colleagues or otherwise. Remember that the uh, webinar is available on the Global Health Network site. So if you want to even send the link to all of your contacts, uh, and if they have an interest, they will then know how to contact us. 
thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm just going to pass back to Nadine to close off the uh, meeting. Um, thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody. Um, what, an, what an incredibly exciting um, initiative and super to see everybody and all the different projects coming under the umbrella. So this is just the start. Um, so it'll be really interesting for all of us to watch this space. I see there were some things that came into, um, there were some questions that came into the chat and some comments. We had somebody from Malawi just saying congratulations. And um, we had a question from David asking about challenges to implementing projects around COVID. Um, so panel Panelists, if you if you can, you might even just put a little um, response into uh, into the chat. As I know, we're out of time. Um, just to thank everybody, um, to say that there's an evaluation link that has gone into the chat. Um, it would be great if you could fill that in. It really helps. Um, and also just to say that the recording will be available on YouTube channels and will come out in the newsletter of the Irish Global Health Network and will be available on on the website. So you can share that link with others. And we have found that people, a lot of people, might miss the live recording and then they can catch the um, they catch the recording afterwards. So thank you everybody.